let us begin. So where were we? We were on uh, client specificity, um, covering the, uh, the three core concepts. Okay, um, so as we were talking about the corrective emotional experience, uh, we'll pick up there with um, under B, B1, is that um, there's issues of counter-transference that can uh, affect the way that we interact with our clients um, and also our fears. So one of the biggest um, difficulties as a therapist is that the corrective emotional experience means that we actually have to be involved. We actually have to show up. One of the keys um, in the interpersonal approach is that if it's not real, it's not going to be helpful. If the relationship that you have with your client isn't actually meaningful to you, it won't work. And this is not because we're trying to manipulate the relationship but it's because we understand that we are the, the core of the interpersonal approach is that we are relational all the way down from our very creation, right? We are created in relationship. We are hurt in relationship. We also heal in relationship. And so in order to provide a helpful experience to the client, it has to be a, an experience that's authentic. In order to provide that corrective emotional experience, which is to respond to clients when they're acting out problematic interactions and maladaptive defenses in a way that's actually different from the way other people have responded to them in the past. And in the way that that's different, it's actually helpful, that creates a corrective emotional experience. One of the things that happens after you provide a corrective emotional experience, the goal is that we are trying to expand somebody's schemas, which we'll talk about a little bit more later in the cognitive domain. We're trying to expand their belief about what's possible for them in relationships. And so what you'll see if you provide a corrective emotional experience is that their behavior will change. They will exhibit in some way more freedom, more confidence, more autonomy. Perhaps they're a counterdependent person. They might exhibit more dependence. They might actually trust you a little bit more. They might exhibit a whole host of things. They might go into some feelings or thoughts that felt unsafe previously. And so when you provide that corrective emotional experience, it opens up new possibilities, and you see that behaviorally in the client. So a key that can help you guys to notice what is actually corrective emotional experience is that when the client starts behaving in a way that you admire, in a way that you think like, oh, wow, they're, they're going there, right? Or they're, they're doing something. You can kind of backtrack. And you can say, okay, what did I say to them right before that? What did I say to them that was corrective? What did I say to them that was helpful? And that can help lend into your conceptualization because we don't always realize the corrective emotional experiences that we are eliciting, that we're, we're creating space for. Um, and so the more we can notice what things that we do are corrective, the more we can plan for the future interventions. Um, but when we are doing that, when we're living in this domain of authenticity, um, one of the great dangers is countertransference. And who can tell me what countertransference is? Yes. And why is that a problem? Um, 
Yes. You are going to enact your own faulty interpersonal process, and that's going to affect the relationship with the client, right? And so countertransference, a simple way to think about it, is any feeling that you have towards the client. So we don't want to necessarily look at all countertransference as bad. We really don't want to look at any countertransference as bad. But like everything in life, it's what do we do with the experiences that we're having? There will be some clients that you will feel a kind of natural care for. Um, there might be some people that remind you of a little sister that you're really fond of. And you might not know that, but you kind of just notice, like, actually, this person's really easy for me to like, right? This person, like, there's something about it. And usually it's because there's something about that person that connects with your relational template. And so the dangers of countertransference are feelings towards the client is when those feelings affect our ability to be effective. And when we act out of that countertransference rather than acting out intentionally from the conceptualization. And so one of the difficulties that we can, um, as you said, something like our traumas can pr play out, our micro traumas can play out, right? So, um, you know, one thing, for example, I've experienced a lot of people in my life who have over spiritualized things, right? I've grown up in Studentville. Like this has been, you know, up here was my playground when I was little. Um, and so I've heard a lot of spiritual language over my life. Now I am a spiritual person, I'm Catholic, I'm devout, like I believe all of it. But sometimes in session, if somebody starts bringing up something in a certain way, in a similar way that I've heard other people hearing it, there's a part of me that can be like, Hook! like, wait, maybe that's, there's a part of me that kind of wants to jump in and be like, whoa, 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 maybe that's over spiritualizing. Maybe we should step up, uh, take a step back. But that's me enacting a problematic interpersonal pattern, a way that I tried to cope with those situations, which is to jump in and say, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's not actually providing the client with the opportunity to work these things out for themselves nor is it actually helping me to be an ally to help this person explore. Is this the way that you're conceptualizing this spiritualization? Is this fit? Like, is this legit? Like, is this true? Or could there be some over-spiritualization? Or could it be somewhere in the middle? If I get pulled in by my own issues, I'm gonna inhibit their ability to be free. Um, so we have to be willing to engage in a authentic relationship, that means that we have to risk being personally affected by the client. We have to risk being moved. We have to risk being hurt. We do not wanna tell our clients things like, you can't hurt me. Nothing that you say is gonna affect me. We don't want to tell our clients things like, I can, I can handle it all. We don't want to tell our clients things like, I'm always going to be here for you. I mean, that's a little bit of a different vein. But we don't want to tell our clients things like, there's nothing you can do that's going to, there's nothing you could do or say that's going to surprise me or catch me off guard. Because that's not necessarily true. Yes. Because you won't. But that's an impossible job. If that's our job, then our job is to be a superhuman, which is something that you can never be. We, it is impossible. If we make that guarantee, I will always be there for you. What happens when I get a heart attack? What happens when my wife's in labor? Right? What happens when I have to move? And so we don't want to make false promises. But what we want to teach people is that, what, what usually what I say to you is that what I have is my attention. I don't see the future. I don't know what's going to happen. But what I have my, is my attention, and my attention is all yours. And that's real. That's reality-based. I can actually deliver on it. But if we say things like, you can't hurt me, that teaches the client 
that they don't actually have to consider me as a person. They don't actually have to consider how their behavior affects other people. One of the things that can be really, really effective, actually, is if a client is saying something and I'm feeling frustrated by what they're saying, or I'm feeling frustrated that we're in the same kind of position again, a very effective process comment would be to actually say, like, hey, I'm feeling a little bit of frustration right now about the way that we're interacting. Because it feels like you're trying to overpower me. And I don't want to overpower you, but I also don't really like being controlled. I can't say that unless I'm willing to risk being affected by the client. And I can't say that unless I'm w being willing to risk feeling. Now, what we do want to say to the client is, hey, if I get upset, I'll just tell you about it. I'll just say, hey, I'm feeling pretty frustrated right now. If I'm feeling... Um, other feelings, what we want to communicate to the client is that, hey, we can talk about this like adults. Yeah? Isn't the same Yeah, and what I would say is, oh, oh, no, Mina. You're not, you're not, you're not hurting me. You're not hurting me. I feel really sad at what you're saying. Like it actually hurts to hear all this. But I can, I can hold this all with you. Right, so what we're not saying is I'm gonna be dysregulated when you tell me things. And that's the difference. We're not saying we're impenetrable. But we're also communicating and acting in a way where we're showing, hey, if I'm, a, if I'm, I'm able to be personally affected by you. But when I'm personally affected by you, I don't become dysregulated because that's the process, right? That's the fear. The, People want someone that can handle it all and do everything and be superhuman. But we're not. We're not Jesus. We can't do it all. But we, what we can do is say, hey, I'm a human just like you. And what I, what's more valuable than you thinking that I can help you because I'm a superhuman is you learning that another fallible human can actually be consistent and helpful, even if they're not perfect. So to be clear here, We would, it would be inappropriate to tell a client something like, what you're saying is too much for me right now. Or to say something to the client like, you're making me anxious. I can't handle it. But I have told the client before right now, you know, as you're talking, like I can feel myself feeling a lot of anxiety. I'm, I'm wondering if that's telling me a little bit about what it's like for you right now. I'm wondering if there's a lot of anxiety that's showing up in the room. I've told a client before, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed by everything that you're telling me because it feels like you're coming in right now and you're just totally dumping this, but you're also not really letting me in. Like you're not really letting me be with you. It feels like this is so big that it's coming and I can't see you. And the reason I said that was because this person's interpersonal pattern was to hyperactivate emotions in order to connect with their caregivers. And the interpersonal pattern in their relationship was an intensity of emotions which other people couldn't handle. And so but what I was saying to him is like, hey, I'm, I'm not pushing you away. I'm holding your hand. But can we explore what's happening right now? All this anxiety, the, the way that you're sharing your anxiety with me right now is actually pushing you farther away from what you want, which is connection, and not bringing you closer. I'm going to identify that, bring that to awareness, and give you an alternative. Like, could we try to share that in a way that I can actually step into? And that's when this person's actually going to experience the intimacy that they need. So one of the dangers is under-identifying, which if we are not um, being personally affected with a client, it's not going to hold real meaning. And our therapists will be, at, or our clients will be accurate when they say, you're just a therapist, you have to care. They'll be right if we don't actually care, if we're not risking ourselves being affected. Now, when we're affected and how we're, we're affected is our responsibility as a therapist. And that's why we need good supervision. That's why we need our own therapy. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we need to protect the client when we're getting overwhelmed. We might be a little bit less effective. 
right? But it's more important to be a little bit less effective than to dump our overwhelm from them on them. That's, that's never good. The key here is artfulness um, in communicating emotion. But it's the relationship itself that heals. It's the relationship um, that provides the healing. It's the relationship itself that's the vehicle. And if the relationship isn't real, the healing won't be either. Our goal is to invite the client into authentic, collaborative work, where we're actually both on the same team working together. And, and the real important word here is, into, uh, is authenticity. So that first issue is when we are under-involved. The second issue, I mean, is what you were saying, um, is over-identifying. Um, and I guess, actually, this is probably a helpful thing here. So when my clients tell me, oh, you don't care about me, you're just a therapist, this is your, this is your job, it feels transactional because you're getting paid, um, I say, absolutely. I'm getting paid right now, and I'm so grateful to be doing it. But if I, if I just wanted to do this for the money, I would be somewhere else doing something else. I actually like want to be here. I would be here even if I didn't get paid, if there was a world in which that happened. But this is the world that we exist in. We live in a world where we all have different skills, and we lend those skills into the collective society. And my skill is that I can provide this space for you, and I actually want to. And your skill in your work is that you do something else, right? Maybe you're a mechanic. Maybe you're a housekeeper. Maybe it's something else. Maybe you're a homemaker. But I'm actually here because I want to. The second thing I say is LeBron James makes a lot of money to play basketball. But I don't think that takes away from his love of the game. I think LeBron would be figuring out how to play basketball even if he wasn't making a lot of money. And you know how I can tell that? Because there's a lot of people <laughs> playing on and one mixtape tours or playing overseas or doing things because they love it so much and not because of the money. They wish they were maybe in the NBA, doing it at a higher level, making more money, but it's not about the money. And that's the same thing for me is I'm here because I love it. Um, so I don't shy away. I, I think it's more effective to not shy away from the fact that we get paid because it's the truth. But then we ex can explore, okay, is, could this be a defense? Could it be that me being your therapist is a really good out for you as a client to actually experience a relationship that would feel scary, threatening, because it'd be real? And real, real relationships are scary. Um, but the second issue is when we over-identify. And so, as you were saying, if we are over-involved emotionally, if we are feeling too strongly to a level that takes us away from the conceptualization, um, we're not going to serve our clients. Um, so when we over-identify, um, the other way this could play out is this person's just like me. Right? This person struggles with the same things I struggle with. There, it is true that there are ways that you're similar. But as soon as we see those similarities, or as soon as we act out those similarities, um, we usually find ourselves actually playing out the same problem that this person had. Right? So in the book, it talks about the example of maybe I feel like I'm exactly like this guy. He's just like me. And so I feel kind of like a, an especial closeness with this person. And then I may play out the same process of, you know, this person was actually too close with mom or dad. Like there was no boundaries. This person was parentified. This person was drawn in. And so I might actually unwittingly and unrealizingly play out that same pattern with this person um, if I'm over-identifying with them. Um, the, the key is to understand that there are zones of similarity and zones of difference. It's absolutely true that you will um, identify more with certain people than with other people, especially when those people share your defenses. And those are the times um, that are most important to have supervision. Um, so our supervisors help us by teaching us to reflect on our interventions, by teaching us to reflect on our feelings towards the client, 
by teaching us to reflect on um, how our own personal story might be getting in the way here. And so that's one of the other things. If we want um, to be effective therapists, if we want to have ex effective experiences of supervision, the more supervision can resemble this same style and be real, uh, the more it's going to be effective. Um, the third, I'm going to put it right here. I know that's getting low. It's fear of making mistakes. This is the other thing that um, often gets in our gets in our way, uh, especially for new therapists. We're saying, oh yeah, please. Um, it does make sense. It's complicated. Oftentimes people come in with a problem, and that's not really the problem. It's just a symptom, right? Um, so for instance, addiction to pornography, masturbation, that's something that brings people in a lot. Um, brings people a lot in, in Catholic circles. Um, and men and women both struggle with it. Um, Usually it's far more taboo for women, and especially in Catholic circles. Um, it's a little bit more accessible for men to talk about, because um, I'm pretty sure that's the only thing that men's talks are about. Um, but that's rarely ever like the issue. It's a symptom. It's a symptom of a lack of intimacy. It's a symptom of a lack of an integration of healthy sexuality. Um, it's a symptom of a... Um, lack of being able to rely on parents to help us through really difficult things, which are like, hey, when I discover that there's this part of my body that if I touch, I feel amazing, what do I do with that when I'm eight? Like, an eight-year-old needs some help, you know? So that might be the thing that people are coming in of, like, this is the thing in my life that I really want to change. But that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so something like that takes a, a usually a, a pretty long time. Um, but I think the key is that if something's not changing in the first session, you're not really being effective in the interpersonal process. So we want to be changing the interactions with the person from the very beginning. You need to take risks with your clients early. Because if you don't, you'll create... In the first session, you are socializing your client's expectations for therapy for you know, the rest of your, your treatment. So in the beginning of your work together, you don't really want to be shy. Uh, you want to read the room. You want to be effective in, in, in feeling out what this person actually needs. But you want to be providing that like right off the bat. So it depends. Some people, some people find... Some people find change really depends on the person's defenses. Yeah, it depends, it depends, it depends. It depends, and then it also depends. But um, yeah, it depends. It really varies. My, my thought process, my experience is it's a lot longer than the manualized treatment approaches will tell you it is. So. Um, in my experience, it's more about years than months. Um, but you also have to ask the client, like, hey, how much do you want? Like, this is one of the things that I say to people a lot, is like, what do you want to get out of this? Do you want to patch up the hole? Do you want to, like, tear this thing down to the foundation? I, I often tell people when they're thinking about termination, like, we can really go as far as you want. And it's, it's not a loaded, like, oh, but you should go deeper. It's really like, we can go as far as you want. What are your goals? And let's help you reach those. How much help mentally does um, a therapist need to be A lot, in my opinion. A lot. Is there a time limit for things you like I can get into now? Or? Yeah. 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 I've been I've been a therapist for three years and I'm teaching you guys. 
Like I absolutely 110% need more mentoring. I'm absolutely a work in progress. Um, but I think that, I don't think it's true that we need to, I think there's always a way in which we can mentor. Sometimes that's just being a peer and supporting somebody as a peer, somebody that sometimes that's being a superior or a supervisor. But I think there's always a way that we can lend our knowledge and our ability um, in, in mentorship. And I, I really do believe that it's an ongoing process. Um, it has to be, you know, in my opinion. Yes. So have you ever had someone come in and be like, wow, you have so aged in the last couple of years? <laughs> wow, way to put me on the spot. <laughs> I've never had somebody come in that said, hey, I need some help. That I haven't thought, hey, in some way, shape, or form, we can be a team. And we can help you out with this. Yeah. That's my answer. Was there a second part? Yeah. Essentially what this theory is, is you get into a room with someone and be healthy. Period. Full stop. You go to therapy. You, you get your own mentorship. You read these books. Um, you stay on the growth edge. Yeah, healthy enough. And then you keep getting healthier, hopefully. But that really is the approach. You become healthy and then sit in a room with a client. And their unhealthiness will come up. And then you talk about it. And in a healthy way, you address it. And then in a healthy way, you help that person to change. And when your unhealthiness comes up, the healthy thing to do is to talk about it. And that's the key here uh, for fear of making mistakes. For one thing, um, clients are actually very, very resilient. Clients are very, very resilient. Um, it's important that we're thoughtful in what we're doing and we're not being impulsive or anything like that. But they can handle, people can handle a lot more than we think they can. And so the second part of that is that the, the, the relationship is resilient. It is not resilient unless you're willing to talk about the mistakes you make, the misunderstandings, the confusions, the different things that arise. We don't need to be afraid of mistakes in therapy because we're absolutely going to make them. What we need to learn how to do is humbly talk about mistakes when they happen. There is, yes. Yep. I may. I may if I think that me saying that would actually be helpful for them. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in client specificity, but if I'm getting dysregulated, no. So if that coping mechanism is like overwhelming me, I usually wouldn't say something immediately. I, I need to kind of, this is that participant observer stance of both what's happening in the relationship and what's happening to me. If I think it's helpful for the client, I might. I might say like, hey, I recognize, I think I was kind of just, I just realized this, I think I was being a little bit dismissive of what you said earlier. I think I, I, think I was a little bit distracted, I'm sorry. Can we talk about that again? Because now that I'm thinking about it, it sounded really important. You learn. You learn how to listen to patterns. And you're listening to the patterns in their behavior, in their stature, in what they're wearing, in how they're talking, in their speed of speech, in what they choose to talk about in the first session. If they say, I've never been to therapy before. Or if they say, hey, we got to talk about this. Or if they say, like, 
I don't really want to be here. Yes. Both, both, both. School for therapy is a good kick into the butt, like into the experience. And we all learn on our feet, right? School, school will give you just enough for other people to think that you can do what you're doing. And then you'll start doing it, and that's how you learn. But you have to start doing the work, and that's why you do an internship. That's why you have supervision. Um, but you'll learn this stuff two or three years. You'll start feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. No, two or three years after you're working. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, no, it matters. Ask that little boy what he thinks. 110%. 110%. For one thing, um, whether we are over identifying, we can be exactly like somebody, and that doesn't mean that we're over identifying with them. So just because we're similar to someone in a lot of ways and can see that doesn't mean that we're over identifying with someone. We over identify with someone when we think we're more similar than we are, and that affects our interventions. It, and Tiber says this, it is, we are more effective when we feel too much than when we feel too little, period. Um, when we feel too little, it's hard to establish the safety. Um, You learn how to be healthy. You realize that the client, you are responsible to the client and not for them. You are responsible to the client to serve them and not for their well-being. Except in the case of extreme situations when they might be a risk to their own well-being. And even then, there is a responsibility for what you need to do. But clients changing is not our responsibility. It's our responsibility to create effectively the circumstances that would make that change easiest. But it, we cannot, you learn to not take on your client's burdens. You learn to say, hey, I'm actually going to step into this with you, and I'm going to be in it, like, for real. And I also know that this isn't mine. I'm not taking it from you. I'm participating in this suffering, this difficulty with you. But I'm not taking it from you. Yeah. I think the book had said, um, they had to take on the client's problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And if it's a client in which they feel that they have to take care of their parent, they're going to feel stuck and they're going to end up not coming because they feel like they're going to just fall into the same trap of their own parents. Otherwise, they're going to be able to kind of abruptly. So it's like, no, no, it's like it's really important to keep them in captivity and not take on the problem. Yes. What we need to be is well differentiated. And differentiation is when we recognize what am I and what am I not? What is me and what is not me? And we are walking a fine line where we are really stepping in to the experience. We're taking relationship for our role in the experience. But our role is not to change them. It's to facilitate their own ability to change. Because we can't change anybody. Only all we can do is really learn to cooperate with them. And when we cooperate with people, it can feel like we're changing. And they might think, oh, you're an amazing therapist. You did all this work. But as long as that's happening, they are just idealizing you and believing that you're the changer here. And how are they going to keep changing all on their own when they don't have an amazing therapist? We have to help people recognize what is their responsibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think maybe. Um, there may be times when we realize, yeah, I think it's, and I think this can happen to us as therapists, like while we're in the work, because we might realize, like, oh, I'm getting burnt out. I need to, like, go work a sales job for five years because I'm actually, because I've been taking on too many things. Like, when we are acting in problematic ways, we take on other people's burdens and emotions. So I do think there are situations in which we need to be healthy enough. We need to be healthy enough. Now, that doesn't mean that we need to be perfect, but we do need to be stable and reliable. Not perfectly so, but enough. So the client's response specificity, we need to tailor our interventions to the specific needs of the client. We're looking at their problems, their developmental experiences, their cultural background. Um, the operative word here is flexibility. We need to be flexible to respond to diverse client needs. What we are really asking, um, w well, the key here is our conceptualization helps us to know what does this person need. We're trying to conceptualize the specific relational experience that this person needs in order to change. That's what client response specificity is about conceptualizing the specific relational experience this person needs in order to change. A client, one client may come in, right? A, a, a young teen might come in. We might talk about sports or games or something for 45 minutes, and that could actually be a very effective intervention because you really need to focus on building rapport, right? But if a 80 or maybe a 60 year old man comes in and I think that we should talk about games or sports for 45 minutes, that's not gonna be an effective intervention. So our, our interventions need to be tailored to the specifics of the client, their specific relational history. We need to figure out like what's the specific thing that this person needs. If their parents were over controlling, they probably don't need a lot of control. They probably need more space. Um, one of the questions that comes up a lot is um, self-disclosure. Should therapists give self-disclosure? What have you guys heard? You know the classes. Should therapists share about their own experiences and the things that have happened to them in their lives. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. If a client has chronically had his dad telling him about all of his difficulties and problems at work. Client specificity tells me that this client probably would not benefit from me disclosing about how I similarly had a difficult situation. Right? If with that client I go, oh yeah, I, I man, I, I can imagine there's so much that goes on for me in my work, I would want to say something about it to myself. All that's doing to this person is reenacting the same problematic pattern where my therapist is acting just like my dad did. Right? On the contrary, yeah. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, the the in, in intake form. Yeah, so most clients, you would have an intake form. It would ask, what's your presenting problem? Ask maybe something about family history. What symptoms do you have? Are you on medications? So you'll have a little bit of information going in. Um, I personally usually like 
to take a look at that form after the first session. Um, because I want to show up and really be available to like, hey, who are you? And I want you to tell me who you are. And I'll usually glance over the intake. I'll usually give it a glance. But I won't really sit down and, and, and really, really look at it until after the first session. Because what's delivered on paper is a lot different than what's delivered in person. Um, but that information is helpful. And there's different ideas on whether, OK, do you want a lot of information on an intake form? Do you want just a little bit of information? And it kind of varies, ther varies therapist to, to therapist. Yes. Pretty much. So the adequate role is one of the ways to kind of come up with yes, I would never want to talk about that. So I would need that within the role of a client maybe in the intake and then maybe that second maybe at a couple or like how does that work? What you're creating is a relational experience, not necessarily taking on a role. What you are doing is trying to create a relationship experience that's different than their expectation for people, which is which is typically role bound. You'll also see that people's patterns line up coherently. And so like there will be a relationship between those two issues somehow. But you're not trying to be mom. And you're not trying to be dad. We're, we're not trying to reparent. We're trying to co-author. Right? We're trying to say, like, hey, I want to be your partner. I want to collaborate with you. And so we're giving someone the experience of, of mutuality and care. But sometimes mutuality and care means being more maternal or paternal. Right? Sometimes I go to my friends and I need them to just be like me up here. Sometimes I go to my friends and I need them to be a little bit more paternal and caring and provide a safer space. Sometimes I go to my friends and I need them to give me a swift kick in the butt. Um, so those that relationship can vary. So isn't that a let's say three to five mm -hmm. um, assessment in a way that they might instead of having to be like a parent, if you're trying to fulfill that role? If you're trying to fulfill that role, if you believe that what this client needs is more caring because they're clingy. They have so many needs. I have to just give more and more and more and more and more. How'd that client become clingy in the first place? What type of relational experience with a parent would create clinginess? Too much. Too much. And so then what would I be doing? And so I would be recreating and reenacting the same problematic process with this client that's bringing them into first therapy in the first place. It might feel good for them, but it's not going to change anything. So what we need to learn is what does this person, not what do they want, what feels good, but what do they actually need? This person needs to learn, hey, you can take care of yourself. This person maybe needs a little bit more boundaries, right? Early on in treatment, we typically align with the defenses. But our goal is to, somebody who's clingy does not need more care. Somebody who's clingy needs to know, I can be connected with people. I can also be myself. And I can take care of myself. I know when I can take care of myself. And I know when I need to rely on other people. Yes. And then I let it go like without meaning to be like close to the attached. Yes. You need to be clinging to a point to like fully let go. Yes. And then eventually be able to step away from that. Mm -hmm. And then but if like like someone didn't have that growing up, right? You need to like just 
Yes. And then, like, maybe, like, so I feel like, would it be, like, an extremely long process for, like, you start to have to, like, like, um, like, get really close, and then, like, mm. between, and then mm. like, do, like, prepare the room, and, and have a lot of, like, the, the combination of things that you could have done? Nope. We're not overcompensating. We're not saying, like, oh, we're going to swing to the opposite end but we are giving a healthy response. And so a healthy response to clinginess is saying like, hey, I feel like you're really pulling from a certain response from me. There's a part of me that wants to jump in and give it to you. There's another part of me that wonders if, if we started doing this over and over and over each session, if I might actually start getting resentful of that need, and that might create problems in our relationship. So I'm wondering if we can talk about what's happening between us right now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Warmth, but warmth and clinginess are not the same. Warmth and care and stability are not clinginess. Where it says Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, just right in the middle. Right. That's what virtue is. The middle ground between two opposing vices. Too much and too little. And what we're doing is giving just right. Now sometimes we'll lean one direction and maybe be a little bit warm and more empathic with one client and a little bit more cold and distant with another client because that's what feels good for them and helps them to actually engage, right? A businessman who comes into therapy, you're like, oh my gosh, tell me, how do you feel? <laughs> They're going to probably be put off, right? So we are tailoring the responses, but we're not over we're not overcorrecting, we're just correcting. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so depending on what self state they're in, there's a part of them that's anxious, that's very clean. There's a part of them that's totally far away. So we learn to identify when each of those parts is coming up, and then we talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Pe it differs even from session to session. Yeah, it differ, and it'll differ in session depending on what you're talking about. There's certain things that you'll talk about that somebody will be all about talking about, and it'll be super engaged and super there, and then you'll shift to a conversation, something else might come up, and all of a sudden they're whoosh, totally dismissive, disassociated, on the moon. Oh, it's always a rough draft. Yes, yes, yes. We are constantly formulating and reformulating our case conceptualization based on our interactions with the therapist. It's a running hypothesis that we keep going. And we test out the running hypothesis by process comments. When they land, we say, okay, this is probably the right direction. When they miss, we say, okay, maybe my conceptualization is off. Um, people don't get attachment styles from significant others. They either maintain attachment styles or amplify, I would say. Maybe that shouldn't be an all or nothing statement because I don't typically tend towards those. But um, when we have really, where do we talk about this? Shock or strain trauma. Um, we'll talk about this more. We'll talk about attachment styles a little bit more when it's coming up. But yeah, there's some wiggle room there. But the same way, you help them. You show up. You listen. You name what's in the room, and you help them to address it in a way that feels like a collaboration and it's not forced. Um, so we want to ask 
what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to help clients live out a different relational experience with the client. That different is going to be dependent on their um, history. Um, but the question that we really want to be asking ourselves are, am I reenacting a problematic interaction or am I resolving it? This is the question that we want to ask with our clients conceptually. Am I reenacting the same problematic past pattern or am I creating a new one and resolving it? When we are in the session, the question that we really want to be focused on is what's needed, how can I provide that? Yes. Conceptualize, you want to conceptualize the specific relational experience that this client is needing to change. Or, um, or actually, the, the same therapeutic response or intervention. I, I didn't say this one yet, but that's important. The same therapeutic response or intervention that you give to one person isn't going to be helpful for another. Um, we need to be flexible. Mm. The questions that we want to ask, um, what does this person need? How can I provide that? That's going to be the thing that keeps us on specificity. That's why this participant observer is really important. We're learning to be right there with the client, but also have a feel. The key is that this stuff doesn't happen in your head. This is not, this is not just cognitive. You need to feel what's happening in the room. You need to develop your intuition, you need to develop your gut, and you need to learn to hone that so that it's trustworthy. What's the example of a client that you think it would be helpful to discuss with? A client whose parents were aloof and never showed up for him and never told them how to navigate the ambiguities and difficulties of life. Yeah. So I was I was working with someone for uh, at a point, uh, a woman, and um, She essentially came in asking for help. And she was asking, 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 and I, in my wisdom of therapist, right, I did the thing that actually it spells it out here as the ineffective therapist, which we are always both the ineffective and the ther effective therapist. Um, She's kind of like, what should I do here? What should I do there? And I responded with like, well, you know, as your therapist, I don't think it would be very helpful if I just jumped in and told you what to do. That wasn't a good response, right? Because I just kind of left her stranded. Um, and it's, it's really kind of saying like, oh, I can't make the decision. It doesn't actually support the person either. Um, later on a little bit, I learned that their parents really, although they knew that they were loved and they believed that they were loved, their parents didn't really know how to show up and give her the emotional support that she needed and also like the practical guidance. Like there were kind of some big rules and expectations, but like here's how you live life wasn't ever really given. And so when I learned that, I realized like, oh, okay, I need to give this person more advice. Now I'm not taking on the role of the like directing their life, but I need to realize that the wound is I don't actually have anybody that I can trust in my life. I don't, I don't actually know what to do. And so the corrective emotional experience in that for that client specific situation is, okay, let me, let me give you a little bit of direction so that you can know that some people can help you out when you need it. Because that's gonna support that woman when she needs help to go to her boss, to go to her priest, to go to her friends. It's gonna support that woman to expect that, okay, when I don't know how to do something, there's other people that can help me work through it. Um, and the key really is um, flexibility. Um, so here we're shifting into the historical domains of the interpersonal approach. And what we're going to focus on, the interpersonal approach covers um, the interpersonal domain, of course, the cognitive domain, um, and the familial or cultural domain.
who can tell me um, what the interpersonal domain is? Nobody? Yes. Exactly. Do you know the theorists that introduced that idea? Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. So Harry Stack Sullivan gives one of the most compelling and one of my favorite definitions of personality. Um, and what he proposes um, is that personality is the collection of the interpersonal strategies that the individual employs to avoid or minimize anxiety, ward off disapproval, and maintain self-esteem. So what the interpersonal approach focuses on is relationships. We're beating a dead horse here, I know. Um, a little bit repetitive. Um, but what we're doing is we are focusing on those repeated, difficult relational experiences that affect the way that we look at the world. It's what we do. It's the simple way to think of it. That should be a two. The simple way to think about it is um, what do we do to avoid anxiety in relationships? Period. That's, that's the best definition for the interpersonal, is what do we do in relationship to avoid anxiety? And we will give um, the interpersonal domain a lot, a lot, a lot of attention, pretty much what the whole book is. Um, but you guys should know that this is um, was a really big departure from Freud, right? Freud said that we had these fixations and that our um, all of our defenses were um, unconscious defenses. And rather what um, Sullivan suggested is that, no, it's actually a little bit more practical than that. We learn to respond based on what we experience. When we experience things over and over again, we respond in the characteristic ways that make that feel the least bad. Those crystallize and they develop into our self system. So the self is not one thing. It's a system of different perspectives and reactions and assumptions that orient us to the world in the least helpful way. Um, what you guys are probably a little bit more familiar with um, is the cognitive domain. And the cognitive domain proposes that what's central to our difficulties and issues is faulty thinking problematic thought patterns. Um, typically, what we look out at here are automatic thoughts, um, assumptions, and dysfunctional cognitive distortions. Automatic thoughts, core, faulty assumptions, and cognitive distortions. that faulty thinking is the center to our symptoms, right? So what Sullivan says is that the way we interact with people in relationship is core to our symptoms. What the cognitive no domain says is it's the way that we think that's the core problem for our symptoms. And with the interpersonal approach, it's an integrative approach. And this is why I want to teach you to you all. Because it's not like, oh, you're either this or you're that. The interpersonal approach is an approach that you are going to be able to use across all theories, no matter what type of specific therapist you become. You could be just a purely interpersonal approach therapist, or maybe you like cognitive behavioral therapy, which looks at thinking patterns. The key is that even if you're a CBT therapist, you need to know, why am I giving this person a thought record, which is the way that CBT explores thoughts and patterns and beliefs. If this person is saying this stuff, this happened and this happened, this happened, and I'm feeling anxious, so I'm like, let's do a, let's do a worksheet. 
That's a problematic interpersonal process. If this person's feeling really anxious, and I think, you know what? This person could really use some relaxation techniques. Let's do progressive muscle relaxation, which is also a CBT technique. That's a helpful interpersonal process. So no, no matter what theory of interventions we use, if the interpersonal process is right, it'll work effectively. And if it's not, things go haywire. Um, now, in the uh, cognitive domain, there's three different approaches that kind of make up the cognitive domain. It's the object relations theory, attachment theory, and CBT. So, who can tell me what object relations theory is? It's uh, focuses on the relationship that the child has with the parent that has the relation to that child and how it can help the child. Yeah, that's exactly it. Object relationship, object relations theory says that our early relationships set the pattern for all relationships in the future. When we interact with our parents as infants, we are not interacting with random people. We are learning the framework for relationship. And so what we're doing is we're creating internal working models. Um, and an internal working model, will, this will be synonymous with schemas. We'll look at it a lot of different ways. But essentially, it's saying, I interact with my parents over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then I abstract the commonalities, the themes between all those interactions. And then I assume that's what I can expect from other people. So whether our parents feed us when we need it. The key here is, are our parents attuned and accurate in their responding? Um, I was going to say something else, and I can't. Oh, the key here is that what object means in this theory, this is an outgrowth of the psychodynamic theory. And what object means is person. So this is um, person relations theory. Object, the reason they use the word object is because it was a dynamic term, and it meant the love object. Right? This isn't an objectification, but it's just a technical term the way that they thought about things. They called it the love object. So here in objects relations, um, we will be looking at love objects. We will be looking at parents. Um, but that's really it on, on objects relations before we move to attachment theory um, on Tuesday. Um, but the key is that the way we interact with our parents internalizes, and we continue it forward. Um, we'll see you guys on Thursday. <laughs>